Hi everyone, I am with Lauren today. Lauren Ackerman, eh? That's your surname? I, yeah, it, well, it's English, Ackerman. Oh, the Ackerman, all right. Well, Lauren, welcome. Um, please tell us about yourself and your business and where you're coming from and how you started and all of that interesting information. Okay, so my name is Lauren. Um, I've been knitting and crocheting for as long as I can remember, so about 40 years. Um, my mom taught me. I'm left-handed, but I knit right-handed and crochet left-handed. <laughs> so <laughs> quite, a, quite a challenge for my poor mom to have to teach me, um, but she, she did it very well. And um, yeah, I love, um, fi well, Knitting and crocheting is definitely my main um, hobbies. They go everywhere with me. I don't actually have a handbag. It is my project bag. My wallet just gets dumped in it and off we go. Um, how I, so I own Little Yarn Craft. I've owned it now for about 16 months. I bought it as an existing business. It used to be called Yarn at Zelly from um, Serene Palfi in Pretoria. When she relocated to Cape Town, she sold the business and I moved it to Joburg. Um, I've always wanted a yarn shop. Um, my husband and I were actually chatting the other day. He said, when he met me 10 year, or 11 years ago, he said, even then I was talking about owning my own little yarn shop. So definitely something that I've always wanted to do. Um, yeah, there's, there was a need in our area. There isn't any small yarn shops close by. So there was a need to have something that would stock predominantly South African yarns. In fact, I only have South African yarns. Um, and then you're more upmarket and exclusive. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I'm just, I get excited when I hear that because that's really important to me too. So cool. No, yeah, no, it is. There, there isn't enough. And um, I know the owners of Arthur Bell's really well. They're probably the most well-known little, little, when I say little, but a haberdashery. I mean, they've been going since like, I think the 1800s or something. Um, and it's a real family business. It's been passed down from generation to generation. And in fact, now my generation is running the shop. So and I was chatting to them and they just said, unfortunately, most of the South African yarn producers cannot produce the quantity that they need to stock to validate the pricing. So um, there is a need for little yarn shops and ones that can keep five or 10 balls of a skein or one off where you might only be able to get two or three of a color and it won't be repeated. Um, the bigger shops need sort of a more commercially dyed process. That's very where they interesting. Can... Actually, I didn't know that. That, that is very, yeah. very interesting. Um, yeah, if you, if you think, I mean, when you've got like three or four hundred people coming through your shop on a monthly basis and there's an advert for a red jersey using a specific yarn, they need to be able to provide that quantity of yarn and you know if needs be reorder and it's it's not always possible some of the bigger places can do it I know they do stock Venice um, and I think they've got African expressions um, but that's about it there are some other dyes that they could look at that they could stock like cargo blues I'm sure would be able to to look at that but I think their niche market is more sort of your imported well, yarn quilting, yeah and not yeah, and and you're, what you're saying is they don't really have space for in, in indie dyers. They they won't be no. able to stock indie dye yarn. No, and it wouldn't be a financially worth it while to do it either. So oh, okay, that's good to know. We'll leave it. We'll leave it to our one our one woman businesses. Yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, when you so you started this business with with that in mind. Um, what do you feel is the main market in the indie dyer community? What are people looking for? What, what in your area, what are people looking for? Um, 
I think it's it's a mix. You'll get your people that are looking for something specific. Um, people are love the feel of an indie diet product. Okay. Um, and um, I know in the beginning, people didn't like the inconsistency of color, but I think that's sort of fallen away and people are actually, a lot of people go, oh, I love the fact that I can buy a solid hand dyed yarn and it's not just one color, there's a bit of flex of different colors or light and dark. So I think people are um, more open to, to that than they were say five, 10 years ago. Um, I've got quite a wide variety of clients. So I've got people um, that knit shawls, knit jerseys, knit um, or crochet blankets. Um, there, there is a big charity movement in Joburg. I don't know what it's like with you guys in Cape Town, but there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of work for charity. Um, so a more I would say I would probably lose out on that because they will go for like your charity yarns or your Mandela yarns or your Kismet yarns where they would make blankets or beanies or whatever um, for for charities. But I do have the odd person who will come in and buy um, a couple of co uh, specifically cottons and they'll do shawls or whatever as a charity project. Now, because I think if you, I always say, and I, I'm sticking to the story, Stick, wait, wait, wait. Let me just go back to the other one. Thankfully, I I think, oh, wait, there's a full screen. I got that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy to say that the most of the people watching this video know me by now and know me that my recordings aren't meant to be this professional thing. So that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> On my side, uh, I stick to my, this one value. If you can't find a South African yarn that's gonna work for you, even if it's for charity, if it's for charity, then buy charity because that's yeah. produced in South Africa by South Africans, for South Africans. Um, so if you can't find anything else, then sure, buy Kismet because Kismets are all, all imported. So the, then it's fine. Um, and, and if you then can't find anything in Kismet, well, okay, then do the blue label thing if you really have to. But, <laughs> but I think exactly what you're saying, the, the first, your first choice should always be, does it say made in South Africa on that label? So are you on that bandwagon as well? Or are you a bit oh, yes. more accessible than me? <laughs> no, no, I'm definitely a... Um, a South African yarn and uh, supporter. I mean, it's just, our yarns are just so beautiful and our indie dyers are so talented. It's really like working with artists. I actually have a bit of an artistic background. Um, I've got very artistic family members. So to be surrounded by art and that is important. And the yarns are just so beautiful. They really are, they just, the quality of the yarn is good. And then your dyes are just so talented. You can take the same yarn base and give it to five different dyes with the same colors yeah. and you'll get totally different um, product at the end of the day. And that, that, that I think is, is important. Whereas I think your commercially dyed stuff, it's all the same. A blue is a blue is a blue. Um, <laughs> true. You know, a DK is a DK is a DK. There's yeah. no, difference in it at all and I think that's what makes it so special is that you can make a product you know a garment or a shawl or whatever and it will look slightly different to the next person even if they've used the same yarn and the same colors because of the way the dyes worked with that specific batch of yarn yeah no I agree and to get back to your question about the charity project there are a lot I mean my my aunt for instance my on a personal level my aunt does um sweaters she knits sweaters for the children's homes yeah so, and um yeah there, there are a lot of charity projects you know i think people are more and more even specifically during COVID, people really started realizing that there's a serious need out there people yeah. are they don't have money 
to buy a sweater for their kids, you know. So I think, or a blanket, or something. And then yeah. Anya has two that I don't know if you know about them. No. It's a charity project that they started, I think, in, in Joburg somewhere. I'm not sure. But it's grown quite large in the Western Cape as well, uh, where they, they actually crochet blankets for people who lost a family member. Um, so okay. they will, uh, someone will uh, nominate that person and say a certain amount of colors. They, want, they, they know the person likes these colors and then they'll crochet blocks. And they also have designated people who sew them together, those blocks. And then they have two or three people that can actually do embroidery <laughs> that will embroider the person's name at the bottom. And then they give the person, the, you know, the family member that blanket. So yeah, it is quite, it, it does get quite big, but obviously for that, you're not gonna use uh, uh, inside. <laughs> You're hard. not going to use our packer. <laughs> no, no, not really, no. <laughs> or any of that. It's a yeah, or if you know, if you have cotton, uh, as, a lot of people, as you mentioned, they use cotton for gifts because uh, mm. so it's not only because of the um, the monetary side. It's not just about the money. It's about people not knowing how to work with an animal fiber item so if you make a blanket for somebody in merino they actually need to know not to put it like on the washing cycle on hot and put it in the tumble dryer afterwards yeah it's gonna make a much smaller little blanket <laughs> well and also the allergy factor you know yeah. I'm, I'm seeing more and more people are putting on posts to say that they're allergic to wool and um which is which is quite interesting um because a friend of mine's actually allergic to wool and she actually found out that it's not the fiber itself it's actually um so when they when they spin it and that they put lanolin in it and it's that lanolin that she's actually allergic to which i think a lot of people are so they so then you're looking at your alpacas or your cottons I mean, I know when I had my little girl, most of her stuff was done with cottons because it was more than warm enough for winter. You know, DK cotton is actually a very warm item. It's yeah. great because you can pop it in the washing machine <laughs> and That's wash it. <laughs> you don't have to worry about um, it shrinking, as you said. And then also any underlying allergies that might pop up from having even an acrylic fiber, you know, there are people that are very sensitive to, to different fibers. And a cotton is a fairly neutral fiber to use. Yes, uh, uh, just to, 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 uh, to go back to the lanolin, lanolin is actually part of sheep. <laughs> That's the body oil. And yeah. if that is removed, you will have, it's like your non-superwash yarn will still have lanolin in it after it has been spun even if you wash it, I mean, I work with that quite a lot. So I, I will work yeah. with a non-superwash fiber and you can still smell the lanolin in the fiber, which I personally love. I absolutely love that. But people are allergic to that. So um, non-superwash uh, yarns will still have lanolin in it. Superwash actually doesn't. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. That's one of the things about superwash is they remove the scales of the fiber. Sorry, I'm telling you about fiber now, but I mean, that's, that's I need the education. <laughs> the scales of the fiber, um, also that's also something that some, if somebody has a very sensitive skin will irritate their skin. Um, if, if you look at anybody's skin cells, you will see they, they're like, it looks like scales. And then hmm. they remove when they do superwash. And in the process, they also remove all the lanolin. So usually if people have a serious um, allergy for wool and they use um, superwash, they, they don't have that problem. That's okay. Just, um, as we say in Afrikaans, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely it's, not, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's really important to know. And also when you talk about acrylic, the, the interesting part with acrylics 
have you ever found just this quick random question have you found that uh, people will tell you i don't knit in in summer and i don't crochet in summer because my hands get sweaty yep okay. and what's your answer to them um that it's probably the fiber they're using yes yeah. so you will find if people work with acrylic or synthetic fabric that you can't i mean i can't even do that in winter not because my hands get sweaty but because it's like yucky um <laughs> I, that's why i don't work with acrylic i just can't i've tried mm. it's specific for charity stuff but i can't work with it it's, i struggle with it and um if it, it's plastic it is plastic so if you you have sensitive skin it's going to be a problem it's going to scratch you yeah uh, so no, and then obviously you've got the squeaking of your needles which people hate as well which is why most people use a bamboo with a, a bamboo needle with with uh, acrylics because the oh. the metal squeaks when you when you use it because it's obviously rubbing against those nylon fibers okay <laughs> that's funny <laughs> okay so Speaking of, about needles, what's your take on, on needles in your shop? What do you have? Because we still want to see the, do like a virtual tour on your shop too. Yes. Um, okay, so I stock predominantly Tiago. Okay. Um, I love Tiago needles. Um, I've got the, the interchangeables and I've got the fixed circulars. Um, I just, they, I stock the, the metal ones um, just because the bamboo really, there isn't um, maybe besides the length of the tip. Um, most people prefer the metal ones. They are surgical steel or surgical grade stainless steel. Yes, yeah, yeah. So they're the same stainless steel that is used in all your surgical instruments in a theater. So they are rust proof. They are um, corrosion proof. They are um, lightweight. I mean, you can take um, a five millimeter and it's literally like holding feathers. Mm -hmm. They are just mm -hmm. so amazing to knit with. Um, so yeah, so that's also great because there's a lot of people that struggle with, um, especially if they've got a lot of acidity in their, their skins mm -hmm. with their, their needles, their metal needles, discoloring and even wearing through a bamboo needle. Um, they're also all laser engraved. So you're not gonna end up, you know, three or four months down the line of heavy knitting and you can't see your your sizes um and then my favorite crochet hooks are the tulip red etimo okay um okay. i've used them <laughs> i've tried do you name the crochet hook i've tried it yeah. um i have years ago i was very ill and I, um after a week of severe iv antibiotics i've built up um crystals in my wrist so if i use I've got to be careful of what hooks I use. Mm -hmm. um, but I just find the Etimo, the red ones are amazing. They don't get sticky. Um, the the uh, handles don't get sticky. The labels haven't come off. My dog's actually got hold of them just after I bought the full set for myself. <laughs> That's I have two Labradors. <laughs> they do that, don't they? <laughs> yeah, and they're forever puppies. Um, so they got hold of them and managed to eat um, through quite a few but um, the one tip they actually chipped the red off the tip it hasn't chipped off any further it stayed the same um, so yeah those are definitely my favorite hooks but I do also have some of the Chiago hooks um, I also do Tunisian crochet I'm not as advanced as I am with knitting and crocheting so I have some of the Tunisian um, Chiago hooks which are a bamboo hook um, you've either got your interchangeables or your fixed um, hooks with the flexible cable. Oh, okay. But yeah. again, it's interesting to, to talk about that because in the Western Cape, I always say people, people really don't understand the difference <laughs> of how Ting and the Western Cape. <laughs> yeah, so, very different. <laughs> yeah, and also in terms of the difference between the rural areas of the Western Cape and the city, because um, I always say, you know, the difference just in income from on my side of the mountain to the other side of the mountain is like it's huge. 
um, it's literally double. Um, mm. So that's always interesting for me. I, I think Tiago, I love a Tiago, don't get me wrong. I have my own, but I can't sell it here. It just doesn't sell. So it's always interesting for me to hear the different areas of the country and how how it works, you know, how the dynamics differ from any mm. side of the country. What I can say is nothing in my shop is imported except for the needles <laughs> and the crochet hook. Yeah, same here, same here. <laughs> and, and as far as needles are concerned, I, I stick to Addy because they're still, for me, I, I always say it's Chihago, then it's Addy, then it's Knit Pro. Yes. In that, in that yes. order. And then if you- And then Al. And then if you absolutely have to, <laughs> if you have nothing else, I mean, you can see there, you see, that's my, one of my displays. <laughs> I've got like a ton of needles. I don't know, how many needles do you own other than the Chihago? So just be honest, how many needles do you own from your grandmother and your mother and, and that sort of thing? None. None? Oh, wow. <laughs> my mom's still got all her own needles. Oh, and then okay. <laughs> When my grand passed away, her, um, uh, her, my aunt took her needles oh, as okay. a keepsake. Um, no, I lie. I actually do have another set of, of needles, but I don't use them anymore. Um, my mom, my sister lives in London, and oh. my mom used to go over quite often. And one year, she bought me a set of fixed, of straight needles yes. from um, uh, Kath Kidston. So they were a uh, bamboo type needle. She's, um, so you know the Cotton Road bag range? Um, it's no. the one with the windmill on, they often have windmills and it's like a, a material with a plastic covering on it. So it oh, yes. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so Kath Kidston, that's actually a knockoff of Kath Kidston. Oh, um, she was the first person that did it. And um, so she, uh, she, she's actually shame, uh, subsequently had to ch close all her stores um, at the beginning of last year. Um, but she does, she used to do prints and you could get anything from raincoats to mugs to pens to, but she had a very large haberdashery section and you could get all sorts of things. So every year my mom would go over and she, it started with a bag and then it was, um, all sorts of um, different uh, haberdashery items. And that was one of them was this full set. So I've, I've, I've got that. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Okay, so let's take a look at your shop then while we're at it. Yes, yes, let me unplug you here. Okay. Okay, so, so let me just uh, tell you that we can only see you for now. There we go. There we go. So um, at the main entrance, I've just got a little um, sort of a sale section there with um, Adele's mohair and then all my bags. Um, and then I've got over here is some of my merinos. I've got cowgirl blues and I've got sweet skeins, which is a new dye that um, she started in uh during lockdown she's from plettenberg bay then i have <coughs> sorry i have my cargo blues sock weight um little balls and then i've got yarn stash um she's a lady from peter maritzburg um the yarn that i stock is a sock blend it's 75 25 merino nylon mix so ideal for socks and then i've got a lady Oh, go down a bit. There we go. She's um, it's called Joe H N C. Um, she's a lady from Rhodes, and as part of her varsity project, she did um, hand spinning, and she's taught the ladies in the community oh, how okay. to spin yarn. So it's completely undyed, hand spun merino from the local farmers, um, that they then wash and spin and and so, so I've got a lot of work. Work. that's a lot it of work. is it is but it's such a nice um nice project to to do and I see she's also starting to make some clothing items and that as well so it's all coming out of her studio 
Um, I've got a couple of Knit Pro things, um, the winders and some of the hooks and the knit blockers. I've got um, knitting and crocheting journals oh, from K Creations. Okay. So they're lovely. They are absolutely awesome. I've got your sound is going out there. Let's just hang on. Okay. Oh, sorry. You're back. <laughs> okay, you're back. No um, and then I stuck. Um, this one is say. Uh, oh, I stuck the Essay Craft magazine as well. So oh, that's also awesome. that shelf. Then on this shelf is all my accessories. Okay. Um, and then if anybody orders something and they're going to come and collect, I've got a little crate system working there. So, okay, nice. And then those are my cottons. At the moment, I've got Moya and Bahia Art and Rose's Yarn Garden. Okay. And I'll be getting color spun in by the end of uh, March. And then my favorite, I uh, have to brag, it's a... <laughs> winding station that my husband made me oh, and my father-in-law father made my winder for me and um he also makes swifts which i sell in the stock uh, in the shop as well as nasty pinners so, okay we're gonna have to talk about the swift um later yeah. not now that's <laughs> <laughs> no, fine okay oh that's a very nice shop you have um thank you so it's it's in my house um, so I'd, I'd never have to leave home to go to work. I have a very far commute every day, which is great. Oh, lovely. So I, I moved my shop. I, I had some a, a shop in the house, but I decided actually uh, very now to just put my, my shoppy stuff back where my workplace is. Because, and this is something you, you will probably then understand, because you buy in from the, the suppliers, from the dyers, yeah. and, um, and I think for most dyers, and I, that's coming back to the, the essential part of your type of shop, and how important it is that those shops are there. And I found that the shops tend to be a bit ugly with each other sometimes, because... Um, it's obviously it's a competition, which is fine, but I think it's important that people that that maybe when a, another shop owner watches this, that I can really say from my side how important your shops are and how important it is for you to be there, and even if it's in close vicinity of each other, it doesn't really matter because. Um, and, and I think that part you said about Arthur Bale was very important. It's a very important part to hear. If I, I am a dyer and I find that if I try and do a shop and my dyeing and all my production at the same time, it's almost impossible to sustain. It um, is. So the, your smaller shops that support the hand dyers are absolutely essential because very few hand dyers have the capacity to run their own shop and yeah. produce at the same time. It's, it's very, very difficult to do that. You, you've almost got to decide, do you want to be a dyer or do you want to be a shop who sells stuff that you make? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think, like I look at Naughty Habits, I take my hat off to, to Mincy. Um, she, she has made that decision. Yeah. She has, I think, two or three supply uh, stores that she will stock. Yeah. And that's it. She says her focus is her yarns and selling her yarns. So she has herself set up and that's what she does. And she's not looking to become a commercial business. Yeah. So yeah. she yeah. is looking at what will give her the best joy and that is to actually sell her own yarn directly to the public one of a kind i think is the same same kind of setup where she sells her yarns um and nobody else does mm -hmm. um which i think is you know each to their own i mean but i do i mean i know besides yourself um 
Gina from Natural Yarns. She has her own range in the Stellar Fiberworks. Mm -hmm. And I know we've chatted about it and she said it's just purely time. She doesn't have the time to stock, to do the shop and to do the dyeing. You've got to kind of take, make a decision of what you want, what you want to do. And also, um, I think very, very few people understand the level of work that goes into an actual shop. And at the same time, very few people understand the level of work that goes into production. So, um, and the stress levels on both sides. Um, I, I'm very honest about this. I'm horrible with ad admin. I'm pathetic with it. So I think that's one of the reasons I sort of decided, okay, I'll do my online shoppy side, but I'm not going to do a physical shop or online shop and production. And I, I really, as you said, um, I mean, is the next one that's going to be um recorded. oh good okay <laughs> and then um then i'll have two physical shops that i'll be doing uh now in march as well at some point i would really like to come to Joburg. if i actually if my husband goes that way then i'll come and say hi uh, he uh, oh no definitely you must let me know yeah he sometimes be, because of his job he has to go for refresher courses and stuff so then I, I'm in the car with him. We always drive up. We never take like a aeroplane. It's, it's too beautiful. The country is so beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. We often, um, our, our thing is to do road trips over holidays and that. So we've traveled most of the country. And um, if we, if my, my husband is not a comfortable flyer, um, so <laughs> if he says we're going to fly somewhere, it's because he really needs the extra time. But um, he, a very good friend of ours lives in Eisner, so it's a road trip down and um, off the beaten track. We'll stay in little door peas along the way. There are no South African English words for that. It has to be a door pea. A door <laughs> so, yeah. Sure. Right. But our, our, new, our new place that we've discovered is Rhodes, which is um, in the mountains near um, Barclay East. It's no, at the foot of Tiffendale. Really? Okay, it's at the Tiffendale Ski Resort. Okay, That's I have to be yeah. honest, the, the Eastern Cape is not somewhere that I, that I, that I often visit. We um, will go up to the Karoo, and then if we do Joburg, we have to go, you know, one specific route. Uh, there was something else I wanted to ask you about. Okay, so what is your favorite... If you have to say, what would you like to knit? What is your favorite thing to knit? And what is your favorite thing to crochet? What are your first loves when it comes to using your fiber? Um, I'm definitely a garment maker. I love making garments. In fact, I have one, two, three jerseys on the go at the moment. I love the jersey um, <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Um, and the one I have 50 rows left of my sleeve to go. Oh. So it's really almost finished. So I love making garments, um, crochet or knits. I do a lot of pattern testing. So I've just finished a pattern test for Sweet Crochet Dreams for her rubies and lace um, top down sweater, which she uses broomstick lace. Oh, um, but yeah, anything. I hate blankets. <laughs> um, I, in fact I've only ever made, finished one blanket I've started a few but I've only ever finished one blanket um, I um, will never you'll never see me knit a scarf or um, so that I'll always crochet scarves I'm not, I'm not one to knit a scarf I just think that's just too my numbing <laughs> I, I need a bit of a challenge and a bit of a change um, so yeah, to the fact that I can't knit two sleeves one after the other. I will do a sleeve and then a neck and then a sleeve, or I'll I have or I'll do a sleeve and then do another project and then do a sleeve. I can't do them um, one after the other. I just find it's too repetitive. I've never done a pattern twice, so I have lots <laughs> and lots of patterns that I've it's done, but I don't enough. have. I don't have. I don't repeat patterns. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I love amigurumi. Um, if I want a, a quick break from and do a, a quick project, I'll tackle an amigurumi project. 
Um, okay, for those who don't know, it's when you like the metal crochet dolls or yes, yes, yes. Uh, a children's um, so toy I, type of thing. Yeah, I love amigurumi. Um, I've got quite a few books about it. Um, I just find, um, I think maybe it's the counting and the maths. It, it 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 helps with it helps if you have OCD because you're counting in multiples of six the whole time. Okay, let me just explain. I don't do that because I get bored and I hate math. Now I know why <laughs> I don't do that. I hate math. Um, I wanted to ask you about the um. So, uh, how much color work have you done in knitting before? Um. So I did. A I did a course where we actually each month we did a block which was supposed to be a blanket I have all the blocks and we learned all different things from basic plain knitting all the way through to brioche so I have done color work I've done a couple of beanies um this year I'm actually hosting a cow okay where we are doing the um junction sweater which is a mixture of brioche and very basic color work in the round um Vincent is andrea maui isn't it that's it yeah yeah um so i'm doing that um i've already done it in fact i actually helped my sister do it so i love color work i can't do the continental or two-handed knitting my my brain's already said to me you messed it up by making me knit right-handed and i should be left-handed there's no oh, way yeah, you can to make your fingers <laughs> So I knit um, completely just with one hand, um, but I've, I've figured out a method and I don't twist my yarns too much, so it's not, not too much PT. So yeah, um, if you give me a pattern, I can follow a pattern. There isn't a pattern I can't follow. So as long as I, I have clear instructions, whether it's a graph or a, um, a pattern, I can, I can do it. I've done color work in crochet, in Tunisian crochet and in knitting. And your favorite designer? Um, at the moment, definitely Andrea Maori for knitting. I love her patterns. They just work out so beautifully. You can just start it and knit and it fits perfectly. It's like, it's like you know, when if, if certain people go, I'm a woolly shopper for clothes or I'm an epi <laughs> shopper for clothes. There are yes. very few people this but or pick and pay because you know you could go in there you know okay a size 14 is going to fit me i have five minutes i like that i like that i like that grab grab <laughs> grab and off you go so she she she's my woolworths <laughs> as far as knitting patterns are concerned okay. um i have a a very sweet spot for um mariana from sweet crochet dreams just because i know her really well mm. um so i love her patterns um, Tunisian crochet, there are, I struggle to find designers, and I think maybe because I'm also quite new at it. Um, but Sonia van Veik, um, designs by Sophia on Instagram. Okay, yes. Um, Mincy will probably mention her because she's one of the naughty friends. Yes. Um, so she, yeah, she does. This is an Afrikaan to this layer, Kluki. Um, yeah. Because it, it, um, I think she did mention her. We were on the phone with each other for nearly an no more than an hour the other day <laughs> that sounds about right with Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so um she's one of the naughty friends and um she's really just incredible she's okay. um you know i think a lot of people if you talk to them about tunisian crochet they go oh it's so complicated i can't do it it's um you know it's too fiddly she's taken that and said i'm she simplified it so she's made it accessible to just about everybody if you've got you don't even need a tunisian crochet hook with her just a normal old-fashioned pony crochet hook and you'll be able to do her patterns and they're very easy to follow they're very um clear instructions uh so yeah i would say she's probably my favorite tunisian crochet designer and beatrix beatrix Neyman, um she she's also i have yet to do a complete pattern of hers but i have a book and i've worked through some of her squares in her book okay. but 
um, it's good to be talking about this because I would like to contact South African designers for the same reason that I've contacted you. Um, I think the more we under, because as, I, as you took, speaking to me, that you mentioned two designers that I don't even know about. And sometimes when we are, most of us that are looking for a knitting pattern will go online or the Ravelry followers will go on Ravelry or whatever. But you will hardly ever find a South African name just popping up um, yeah. or a South African designer just popping up. And uh, for me at the moment, the more South African designers I can support, the better. Uh, I also had quite a long conversation with Yuanita from Yuanit. Oh, she's amazing. I love her. Oh, she's, she's, a, she's a personal friend of mine. I absolutely. When I first met her, she said to me, oh, at that stage, I didn't have the shop. I had my own little Instagram and it was Leah Creation. She goes, oh, you're Leah Creations. You're such an inspiration to me. And I went, um, okay. <laughs> I was so blown away because in my mind, you anybody who knows me I will never say I'm an advanced or an expert I don't know it there's there's still something I need to learn or something I need to master mm -hmm. and um that's what I think makes it so so much fun mm -hmm. but I also find with a lot of the international designers they use yarns that are available to them mm -hmm. so it's very difficult if you don't have access to those yarns to get the same results yes. so i i find like with a south african designer um they use south african yarns say so you're going to have a product and you can walk into shop and go i've got this pattern from this designer um it says it's cargo blues and you can you can provide them with exactly the same product which um, will give them that result so like you know if my generation we grew up you had your owl and your style craft patterns and you bought the yarn at, that went with the pattern and you knew that pattern that needles you were you took your measurements and you could a for away and you could knit yes. and now you know you go okay it says it's a double knit but is it a double knit is it maybe because you get different thicknesses in double knits um you know i just think you look at the um um or as everybody says sheepies it's um they the river wash or they stone wash double knits isn't a double knit um compared to what a normal double knit is it's actually very thin but it's because of the way the yarn works up that it actually works up to be a double knit but when you're holding the fibers next to each other it's much thinner so you could actually use that as a four ply and you know so now you've got a pattern is it going to give you the same fit is it going to feel the same way and you know you've spent a lot of money uh, a sweater rough you know if you want to do a long sleeve sweater in a south african merino yarn you're looking at about a thousand rand yes, so yes depending on when you're buying it yeah and um and it's and, and that's not always designed for the South African women's body. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the South African know, designer is going to design for our bodies. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and as much as the designers are approachable, it is, it is very different. I mean, I, my junction sweater, I used Miss Lamott. Hmm. Um, my sister and I did it together as a, a way of, her trying to get through um being stuck completely isolated with COVID mm. so it was a way to be connected um we've been very blessed here in South Africa that we have been able to be as free as what we are I mean uh, yeah <laughs> we won't go into the COVID. but anyway um so it was a nice way for us to connect because I haven't seen her since 2019 um, early 2019 so we did it together and she was able to get exactly the same yarn that the pattern required and the fit is completely different and the this the way the fibers worked up was different um you know so when you 
you've got to take that into account when you're taking a pattern and that's where I think now more than ever people needing to do swatches is so important and making sure that they can get the, an accurate measurement. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I had an immediate guilt trip there. I don't fight <laughs> at all. Um, but on the other hand, it, that depends on what I'm knitting. Because I yeah. usually, I think if you know the designer, if it's like you're saying, Andrea Maori is your woman, while Caitlin Hunter is mine. Um, yes. And I know the pattern by now. I know exactly what she's going to do. Um, and also... Do you think that there's a there's a need for um, fiber education in South Africa, just on a different level? Because you were talking about the fiber thicknesses and all of that, and I have found that very very few people actually know the difference between, you know, they don't they don't know fiber, they they don't know what they are actually working with. If, I do think so, and I think it comes down to educating the yarn shop owners that when they sell that they educate the um uh these the actual purchases i mean i know i'm guilty of it um it's just pure laziness i need to actually up the information i put on my website of the different fibers and the content and what they're suitable for because uh, you know it's just I've been into many websites and it's not just South Africa, it's around the world. You can go into any website, you click on a fiber and it says suitable for socks, shawls, sweaters, uh, blankets. Uh, basically, you can take that fiber and you can use it for everything. But is it really suitable for everything? Can you really use it for everything? Um, you know, and I think you need to kind of, we need to, to educate people a lot more as a as a shop owner when they come in and when we assist them with what they want to buy um what is actually suitable you know yeah are they just like buying for the sake because it's pretty do they have a project in mind is it the perfect yarn for that project it's like you have to tell people over i don't know about you but i have had to tell people over and over again no you cannot use a merino top to crochet a blanket or, you know, you, you, it's not going to work. And it's, it's so strange how people just don't know. It's not really strange because the last, I think, probably from the 60s or really 60s, 70s, 80s, everything went to wool is the L ball of yarn on the shelf. Mm. So it's almost a re-education about what you need to use. Um, I was thinking about something else I needed to ask you now, and it sort of went out my head. <laughs> um, or what I wanted to ask you, you know, it's just, it's interesting how, how we all really say the same thing. Um, but it's the actual, um, we well, say, so, you know, I know a lot of stuff, but it's the actual doing of the stuff that's going to be the problem. Um, yeah. And, and to be able to tell somebody when they when they come into a shop, um, I found it in the art world as well, is that people go into an art shop and they ask for something and the staff has no cooking clue what they are asking for. So depending on your shop, if you are the uh, sole owner, then it's fine. Then you already know and you can answer people's mm. questions. But if it's a bigger shop with like staff members, they actually need to know the fibers before they're selling it to people. Um, it's simple, the difference between merino and cotton. If you have a pattern, and I would really like your, uh, do you know how long we've been recording already? Um, because I think we've got an hour. I don't know. I'm sure it'll t kick us off. <laughs> okay, so if they kick us off, then we know. Um, then we know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, my uh, a cut a pattern say a sweater pattern if you want to change it to a cotton fiber because you don't want the animal fiber or you can't afford the animal fiber because affordability is also an issue um affordability i mean uh, as i said it, it differs from area to area and i always have a very soft spot for people who say you know i really want to knit this 
but I can't afford that yarn. So if you need to switch yarn, say from a, um, a cotton a merino to, and all you can afford is the cotton, what would you suggest pattern wise? Because a lot of people say, okay, I'm just going to switch to cotton, but they don't understand the different five, the difference of the fibers. They don't understand that that cotton actually just stretches far more. It just um, sags a lot more. And they, they are disappointed at the end of the day. What would you tell them adjustment wise? How can they adjust those patterns or what should they do if they want to change fibers in a pattern? So with a with a cotton with a cotton fiber, obviously it's going to stretch because it's a lot heavier. Mm -hmm. So that's what people need to understand is that they might need to knit the sweater slightly shorter. Mm -hmm. um, and then the the other the other thing is that when you knit with a merino, you've got your stretches this way. Mm -hmm. So you'll probably need to go up a size. Okay. Um, because you want to make sure that you've got a bit of give because you're not going to have give this way as okay. much as what yeah. you would with the merino. Yeah. So it's going to be much tighter that way. Um, I've knitted a lot of items with cottons um, and I actually haven't really ever thought about, other than changing the size, I haven't really ever thought about um, anything else. I'd take a pattern and then um, off I go, and I knit it and it's fine. I actually had one of my favorite um, patterns. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the color eventually just faded and it looked awful. I must, uh, it's one of those that I think I should actually just sit down and do it again. It was a DK cotton and it was just beautiful. And the pattern actually asked for a pure wool cotton. It was a Jaeger pattern. And it worked so beautifully in the cotton. Um, and I had no problems with it ever. I didn't feel like it stretched, but I like a long jersey. So I think um, if somebody was wanting a, a more fitted feel, then definitely. Another option um, to use instead of 100% cotton is your cotton bamboo. Very similar in price. Um, and it's got a lovely drapey feel. In fact, um, I actually, I actually recommend it quite a lot to people to use um, instead of a merino fiber is to use a, a cotton bamboo and you've got that shimmer from the bamboo. It's just yeah, it's so absolutely yeah. stunning. Um, and I think working with a pure bamboo is a little bit tricky. I haven't done that yet. It's actually but, heavier than cotton. Um, the, co yeah. the bamboo fiber is heavier than cotton, even though it seems lighter. Um, once you've actually worked with it, it is heavier. Um, so, okay, so your answer to somebody was, would be, if you're going to do a, a cotton, you're going to switch to cotton, then just a bit shorter, maybe, and a bit wider. Yeah. Then. Okay, yeah. good. That's good information. I think um, it's needed. That's a type of education that, you know, we tend to do, I, my next recording for myself on my YouTube channel will be sock knitting in Afrikaans because there's nothing. A lot no. of <laughs> nothing in Afrikaans. So, and, and I struggled, I promise you, because I'm very much bilingual and I mix my tails very deliciously. So the, <laughs> the problem is that I now have to switch to Afrikaans terminology, which is kind of tricky to, and then when I started switching to Afrikaans terminology, I realized how difficult it must be for Afrikaans people to switch to English terminology. It's, it's a really, it's a brain thing. I think, I think again, it's regional. Mm. Um, you know, um, a couple of years, well, I'm not talking like with my mom sort of generation. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very Afrikaans stock for in Novice Hickel and Novice Bray and Novice oh. Bay, Afrikaans Patrona and Engels Patrona. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And now I think there's more English than there's Afrikaans. Yeah. And most people, I've done workshops with Karen Ardendorf. I've done workshops with Hilda Stein. Um, and, you know, they'll they'll stand up and they'll go, okay, um, do you want English or Afrikaans? And even if the majority of people are English speaking, I mean, are Afrikaans speaking, they'll say we crochet in English. English. Yeah. We knit in English. So I think 
um, you know, it's almost like your computer language. It's it's all English. And even though people are Afrikaans, they, they're learning, especially the newer people are only learning in, in English because that's what's available. At the same time, what I have found on my side, though, is that people are asking for Afrikaans because, uh, again, as you said, it's regional. It's also uh, depending on rural and city. You know, it's, it's very interesting how that different between rural areas and city areas uh, yeah. and, and I, I saw that when I was growing up we, I, okay that's a long story um, well, we had this one guy came from a farm um, coming to, into grade 8 I think that would be no, standard, that would have been standard 6 um, yeah. and he, well, he just refused to speak English he said I don't need English I'm going to go farm I don't want English. <laughs> it, it, it really depends on area to area. And I, I do think that there is a need for Afrikaans. Just knitting tutorials in Afrikaans. Yeah. Because a lot of the older people, not older people, my generation, I'm 47 now, are starting to say, oh, you know, it will be a and brave, but they don't have a cooking clue. So it's for them to start over mm. in English is difficult. I, I think there's room for both. Definitely. And then at some point, I, I'm guessing we're going to have to do Koza and Zulu too, but as soon as I get there, I'll do that. Okay, okay we'll please just have an education on how to pronounce the name for PE, please. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that, that, that will be the start of our Koza, then we can carry on from there. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and I think uh, for me, language is just a method to communicate. It's just a communication method and the more we can learn to communicate with each other the better um so if, if if we can incorporate languages which we are doing anyway i mean for me one of the best ideas in this country was banagalo although i don't understand it i think it was one of the best ideas you know um, yeah. but yeah i am it's it's interesting i'm gonna go back to the cotton side and the bamboo side now, um, oh, yes, that's what I wanted to ask you. Um, you said you were going to start Color Spun? Yes. Um, <laughs> now, Donna is an amazing woman. I've, I've, a lot of time people will know, do you know this person? I'll say, no, I don't know that person. I don't know that person, but I know Donna. <laughs> and she's an awesome lady. Um, she is really amazing. And to, tell, to, to go back to the website thing that you talked about, uh, have you been on her uh, actual website? Yeah, I have. Yeah. <laughs> and the information, uh, fiber information she gives there is amazing. It is. Yeah. And she's, got, she's got a lot of information about fiber. And, um, and, and I've, I've learned a lot from her just, in terms of fiber. Uh, so I think if you would say other people that you can suggest other than Donna about teaching people uh, about fiber, people that you've learned from, um, just the different types of fiber in the past? Um, I must say, uh, chatting to Bridget from Calgary Blues, she's mm -hmm. very informative. Um, I know her, one of her more recent blogs was about different yarn weights okay. and you know it's it's when you um, deal with people who just buy the yarn mm -hmm. it's very different than when you chat to people who actually dye or work with or make the yarn mm -hmm. um, so um, chatting to her I I learn a lot. It's it's very different, and you know her process. And she was telling us somebody was asking her questions about dye lots, and you know, and that kind of thing, and why she doesn't have dye lots, and what's the change, and and I understand a lot of that aspect. I mean, you know, it's like if you dye your hair, I can give you the same color hair dye as me. And just depending on how long it lies in the bath, the temperature, the atmosphere, the the, the time of the day. The water pH the water level. Water, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, we'll get totally different color hair. Um, and 
it's the same thing with with a with a fiber you can take exactly the same fiber and just depending on the the season and the time and that you're going to get a different color so i've learned a lot from her um donna has always been a wealth of information her and i just clicked we we get on really well um we had um whenever i chat it's also like a two-hour conversation um, <laughs> Minty, um, I don't, I haven't had many conversations with her, but from what I've heard, from what I've listened, listening to her, she's also very informed, informed about the different yarn types and um, getting the right mix to get the colors out that she wants. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so the, those people I would say are the people that I've learned the most from as far as fiber different fibers are concerned and i'm i'm new to the whole thing so for me i'll pick up information from everybody um it's very much like having a new baby um everybody's got a piece of advice to give you um, and then you've got to work out what works best for you and what you you've got to listen to and um you know who's going to give you the the best information so um, yeah, I do sift through a lot of people's information. <laughs> Some of it, I just yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Very nice, yes, yes. No, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's. Uh, I think we're getting very close to the end. Um, give me your last thoughts on what would you like to say to the indie dyers out there, um, in general. As a shop owner, what would you like to say to the people who are dying um, to sell? Because many people just die for themselves. And um, yeah, what would what would you like to say to to them? Actually, to us, but them. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry. Um, I would say to them, you know keep going, um, experiment, experiment with color. Um, people are very uh, keen to um, try different colors, different yarn weights. Um, I, I think amongst the any dyers, there, there's gotta be a, a, a separation. So you've got your more commercial indie dyers that will do sort of your repeat colors, like your Moyas, your color sponge, your cowgirl blues, um, Muslim might to an extent. Mm. Um, that you can you can have a certain colorway and you can basically order it again and you'll probably get exactly the same color. Um, your more experimental indie dyers, your ones that will will do a batch. I think um, perhaps maybe keep a note so that if you do find that you've got a specific color that is very popular that you can replicate it mm. you know it obviously won't be exactly the same because even with your commercial indie dyes it's not exactly the same but it will be similar so or if there's a color that you liked that you dyed make a note of it that you can repeat it because people will want it um as a shop owner, it's very difficult to say whether a color is going to be bought in sweater quantity or not. So I know a lot of the dyes will say, you can order sweater quantities, we'll dye a batch for you in sweater quantity. It's often difficult because I might have a person who really likes a color and buys one skein because they want to add it into a shawl or use it as uh, contrast in the color work sweater so it's difficult for me as a small shop to say I'm going to order 20 skeins of every color mm -hmm. so I think maybe have a range which could be then reordered in sweater quantity mm -hmm. so <coughs> if I take cowgirl blues for example if I've got somebody that comes in and they want to make um, a navy blue sweater I can then get that amount of that, that, that quantity that they would need and then place an order with them for that amount of yarn. And then it's the same color. Whereas with some of the other more um, 
experimental diets, it's it's very difficult to say, okay, I have color, whatever, and my customer really wants this color in sweater quantity, um, to actually be able to get it is almost impossible. So I think definitely people need to look at perhaps being at a position where they can replicate colors um, for a larger quantity, maybe at a later stage. Yeah, I think especially, um, maybe specifically the tonals. I think uh, yeah. the tonals, what I have found is that the dyers will have a, a series of tonals that are their base colors. And, and um, I, I'm, I'm watching the colors behind you right now. <laughs> Those are beautiful colors. Um, I think also when it comes to doing uh, um, a variegated or speckles or whatever, that, that will be where your problem will lie because that will be difficult to replicate. You can use the same colors, but it will be difficult to replicate the, ex same, this, the exact same look of that. Would you say at the moment, somebody told me that tonals are becoming a bit more um, popular at the moment than say the speckles or the variegated? Will you, will, will you say it's that is the right thing? I think people are going for it because they know it's a sure thing. Okay. So um, they know that they can buy six skeins and it's all going to look the same. Um, but I think, um, you know, I understand that whole thing with them not being able to repeat the exact same colors, mm -hmm. or, but it will be similar. Yeah. Um, so, um, it, for example, if I look behind me, I've got that sort of pale blue between the greens and the pinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a repeat order and it worked out beautifully. And it was um, initially going to be an order for a customer and she canceled, but I managed, uh, I did sell it. It was just so popular. Um, but I could say to her, look, I would like you to do the it's color again. The colors, yeah. Yes. And she was able to do it. Where I, um, I know that um, some of the dyers, they either refuse to do it or they're not in a position to do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just think at the end of the day, we're all trying to put bread on the table. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to turn a customer away, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to sell a yarn um, to somebody if I know that they're not going to be able to maybe... Um, make a shawl with that specific color and then later on decide they really like it and they'd like to make a sweater or they walk in and they like the color and I've got one skein mm -hmm. and they want that color for a sweater and I can't I can't give it to them. I'll provide it, yes. So basically uh, indie dyers out there if you want to make this a professional job even mm -hmm. if you're just an indie dyer I'm just, then there has to be a consistency. There has to be yeah. Uh, at least have one series because we all have I mean I'm I'm being an artist it's very difficult for me to do the same thing over and over again I'm, I'll die of boredom but at least have yeah. one series or one part of the the dying setup where you know you will be able to repeat um yeah. that color way um because exactly. I've noticed that there are people that will call it, um, okay, they'll have the one of a kind numbers and then they will have, um, they will have the repeat colors or the permanent colors as they call it. Okay, so that is kind of an important part to remember. Um, yeah. What would you like to say, that's what you're saying to the indie dyers, what would you like to say to the buyers out there? The people who are watching this and that are part in the public, what would you like to say to them that will come and buy yarn? <laughs> come and buy yarn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but, but in terms of, of yeah, it's quality and, and let's put it this way. Why buy a South African yarn rather than an import? Because you're supporting South Africa. Yeah. And I think it's important and because not only local is lacquer, but um, 
local is local. Um, a while ago, I was chatting to somebody about honey. And you know, everybody goes, oh, I must get honey, specific honey from, you know, um, or raw honey. And um, this person actually has bees. And they were saying to me that if you want the best natural effects of honey, because honey is medicinal. Yes, it's definitely, definitely I agree. Yeah. You need to buy it within a specific area. So I can't go and buy honey from Heart and Boss and expect it to give me medicinal properties because I need to buy honey from Gauteng because yes. the bees in Gauteng are able to give me, through their honey making process, they're able to give me the nutrients that I need from what is around here because the climate is different. Yeah. And I think that's the same, you know, we're, we're in South Africa, the South African dyers are dying for our market and they are definitely um, focused on what works for us. And like we mentioned earlier, yarn weights, I mean, there's so many beautiful sweaters out there and you go into the, um, into the, into Ravelry and you open it up and it's an Aran weight or it's a super chunky or, and you just think, I'll never wear that. And the same, you know, like we chat quite often, but people in Cape Town will wear very different clothing to what you would wear in Johannesburg. Um, we can get away with a lightweight sweater in winter. Although we have very cold weather, it's very dry. We don't have the wet, which mm. you would have in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. Durban, you know, in the coastal areas along the, um, the Durban coast, are very um, moderate temperatures. So they might even wear a sweater. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and I think our South African dyers pretty much cover that. They're not um, going to necessarily, you know, you, it's very difficult to find a South African dyed chunky weight or Aaron, there's very few dyes that actually do that because it's, it's not popular. But actually, because I, that's what I, I, I use that. But again, as you said, the Western Cape, the area that I live in, we go like to, and I know in some areas of the world that's still warm, but here we go, I think last year to minus one, minus two degrees Celsius, and there's snow on the mountain. And if there's snow on the mountain, it's cold. So I, I, yeah. that's a very valid point. Um, you know, if you're going to die, uh, and I, yeah, that's a really valid point, actually. So, how does that influence the online shopping market? Do you think? Um, I don't know, because like I'll, I like for me for the shop, I focus on more a sock weight yarn. Um, I've got very little double knit. Um. The double knit I do have is a cotton because a lot of people will use that for a blanket. Um, so I think people will will buy according to what they know works. But um, from a from a shop owner's perspective, you need to be aware of what your the area where you are and what your target market is. So my target market is focusing on my local and focusing on Gauteng. So I'm not necessarily going to have a yarn that's thick enough for somebody who lives at the foothills of the Ceres Mountains because it's <laughs> freezing cold there. It's, it's, um, it's really cold. <laughs> it's really cold, yeah. But um, it's not, not to say that. It's not to say that, and that's also what I want to say, is that I'm not unapproachable. So if I don't have something on in my shop and it's something that you really want, mm -hmm. talk to me. You know, if I can't get it, I'll definitely find somebody who can get it in for you. Or, um, yeah, I'll definitely try and source it or I'll give you a substitute. Um, so I think... You know, that, that, that to me, my personal motto is to try and be as approachable and um, and interactive as possible with everybody, even the people who have to shop online. And there are a lot of people based in Gauteng who've had to shop online just because of high risk and not being able to go out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, 
I've got a, a very small echelon of people who will actually just send me messages and go, okay, I've seen this on your Facebook page. I'd like it and I'll put the order together for them. Um, so they don't actually even go through the website. So yeah, definitely that I want to be um, seen as, although people might not see me face to face, they can contact me and I will help them out. Okay, last question. Last question. Yeah. This is the last question. Do you feel that COVID has been kind to the wool industry at the moment? Because uh, have people started knitting again, crocheting again on your side? Um, has there been a bigger, uh, more people asking just for yarn and that sort of thing? There definitely has been a move towards more people occupying their, their hands um, while stuck at home. I've seen a lot more people have, especially with interactive meetings and that they, they're doing crafts um, as opposed to um, sitting just bored out of their minds for two, three hours at a time. Because um, unfortunately, interactive meetings seem to have now, when you were in the office, the meeting was an hour long and nowadays they can go up to five hours. So I think people are, um, I think people are, are definitely trying to keep their hands busy and a lot of people have gone back to the fiber craft last year was an incredibly good year for me um this year has been very slow mm -hmm. um takeoff but a lot of people have said it so it seems to be no, an no, industry no. all of us yeah no, everybody. um uh, january february have just been really bad year a bad start i think what happened was everybody thought we were going to start january where we ended off at the, um in december Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, everybody came back from holiday and they suddenly had all these restrictions and everybody's now gone into a panic mode and worried about income. So I think a lot of people have now kind of said they'll use what they've got mm -hmm. um, or they're looking at a, at a less expensive alternative to what they've um may have splurged on last year so um yeah again i think it's just um it's seasonal um i'm not going anywhere i'm going to no, no, no. Just going as long as possible and you also have to take into little things into account um it's year end february is mm -hmm. always a difficult month for everybody because um it, like if you have your own business um um, January and February are two very difficult months, always. I mean, that's that's a standard thing because it's year end and people are holding on to their money. It's, yeah, I think, also and the schools, school books. I think the schools, because people have been so uncertain of when the schools are going to start again, that, mm -hmm. um, you know, they were really just holding on to what they had. Okay, I did say that was the last question. I think it's going to start kicking us out now. It was lovely chatting to you. Um, lovely chatting to you too, Alvary. It's so Thank good you so to actually see someone's face. Um, you know, I, I think the other day I heard this. Uh, it was on a completely different subject. But this one woman said that um, when we were younger, we used to watch TV. And we would know that that character isn't a real character. You know, it's just a, it's a, like many layers in that character. It's not a real character. But a lot of people have switched to YouTube, especially the younger kids that watch more YouTube mm -hmm. channels. And uh, while well, there's a scary aspect to that, there's also a good one because this is the closest we will actually get to sitting down one on one, real people talking to each other. And I think there's a very, definite need for that it's fine to have your face on instagram it's fine to see you on facebook but i believe that there's a necessity to for people to know who you are and um i am sure that they would be very glad that they've met you have a so lovely much. day and take care of yourself and we'll talk again especially about that swift thingy i'm, I'm I'll, I'll talk to you a bit you know once you're offline now Perfect. Bye. Bye. Bye.